get together and study the Word of God. As we have been studying on these various messages as well as the messenger, messengers, I have thought about something that uh, Stephen in the New Testament said in Acts chapter 7. In regard to the history of Israel, he said in verse 51 and 2, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised and heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom ye are, ye have now been the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels, and have not kept it. We're reminded of the fact that the history of Israel was that they rejected the will of God. They rejected the authority of God, and they killed many of the prophets of the Lord. In fact, our Savior himself in Matthew 23 cried out, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, and stonest them that are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thee together, like a hen gathered her chickens under her wing, but ye would not. We need to consider this afternoon three things in our study. First of all, we want to do a kind of overview of the book of Micah. Then we want to discuss some of the highlights of each chapter, seven chapters. And then we want to make some modern day applications of some things that come out of this wonderful little book in the Old Testament. And yet, even though it is a little in the length of the revealed message, it has some great and wonderful truths. The opening statements of the book of Micah reveal that Micah was likely a native of uh, Moresh Gath, a town about 20 to 25 miles southwest of Jerusalem in the southern kingdom of Judah. Micah was the prophet during the time of the reigns of Jotham and Ahaz and Hezekiah, who were the kings of Judah. According to uh, chapter 1 and verse 1, the Bible says, the word of the Lord that came to Micah, the Morashite, most Morashite, in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. The message of Micah was to be a message to the southern kingdom of Judah, but it was also to be to the northern kingdom of Israel. Micah was contemporary with the prophets Isaiah, who lived about 725 B.C., and Hosea, and very possibly the prophet Amos. Micah lived in the late 700s B.C. and perhaps even into the 600s B.C. He declared himself to be a prophet of God in the very beginning of this message when he makes it very clear as to what he is doing. The word of the Lord that came to Micah of Morasheth. The name Micah, it is believed, means who is like the Lord. The message was indeed primarily to Jerusalem, the capital of the southern kingdom, but it was also unto Samaria of the northern kingdom, according as we've just read in chapter 1 and verse 1. The message applied to both nations. Under the heading of major themes in the book of Micah, we want to consider the fact that there are the themes of hope and restoration with all that the prophets said in revealing and exposing the sins of Israel and Judah and uh, the ungodly things that were done during that history and the condemnation that is brought upon them. We see also that there is great opportunity for repentance and for restoration to the people if they will indeed repent. So after repentance, after condemnation, after punishment, we see that there is hope and there is restoration. Micah brings out very clearly though that although sin is hateful unto God, it is against God, it separates one from God, the Lord nevertheless is willing and ready to forgive those who will repent of their sins. The themes of righteousness and social injustice are of great importance in the book of Micah. Micah highlights the sin of his nation and treating sins as, as other people, as being uh, just as unacceptable to God uh, as sins against God himself. 
Of course, all sin is against God, but there are personal sins that people commit against one another, and uh, he is letting them know that when you sin against one of your own people, you are sinning indeed against God, and you're in violation of his will. God demands justice from his people, and Micah's references then to the coming of the Messiah are of great importance in this book, and he also makes the point that the Deliverer, the Messiah, will be born in Bethlehem of Judah. Micah has additional concerns and emphases in this book. For example, he was very concerned about the people who lived outside the cities, those who lived out in the rural areas, the farmers, the peasant farmers. As a matter of fact, uh, Brother Max Patterson wrote it. He said, whereas Hosea is known as the prophet of love, Amos, the prophet of international justice, Micah is called the prophet of the poor. And uh, Micah had great concern with the poor people of his nation. Micah was a man of strong conviction. He was filled with courage, filled with the power of the Holy Ghost. According to chapter 3 and verse 8, he says, But truly, I am full of the power of the Spirit of the Lord, and of judgment, and of might, to declare to Jacob his transgression, and to Israel his sin. So he declares that I'm preaching by the Spirit of God. God is giving me His Word. I am preaching to both nations. And I am going to tell you the truth as it is. And I'm going to tell you your transgressions. He wasn't hesitant at all to proclaim the Word of God simply, purely, straightforwardly, as plainly as it could be. He denounced the wickedness of both Israel and Judah. And he foretold the destruction and the captivity of Israel by the Assyrians. He spoke of the invasion of Judah by the Assyrians as well. Later, the Babylonians would invade Jerusalem and destroy the temple. If you notice in chapter 3 and verse 12, he says, Therefore shall Zion for your sake be plowed as a field, and Jerusalem shall become heaps, and the mountain of the house as the high places of the forest. Some of the problems that were addressed by Micah as seen from each chapter, we see as he begins his message, it begins with the fact that Judah was forced to pay tribute to Assyria under King Ahaz. The result was that both the rich and the poor suffered. The king's advisors were divided over whether they should make an alliance with Egypt or with Assyria. But if we know the history of God's people, they were warned time and again not to make alliances with Egypt. The custodians of the law abused their power. The nobles cheated the poor. The judges accepted bribes. The prophets flattered the rich people. The priests were doing their teaching merely for hire. They just wanted to make money out of it. There was a great lust for wealth among the people. And the greedy tyrants laugh at the possibility that there could be any judgments made against them. And materialism overwhelmed the people of God. In chapters 1 through 3, we are foretold of the judgment or doom on Samaria. Chapter 1, verses 2 through 7. And then Samaria in Israel is about to be destroyed and the cities of Judah are facing an invasion in the latter part of chapter 1. In chapter 2, Michael lists the sins that are committed by the people of the Lord among themselves. And he talks about these greedy, avaricious landowners and land grabbers who would lie awake at night on their beds. And as they did so, they were dreaming and conspiring and plotting, devising schemes to be able to force the poor man off of his land. In Micah chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Woe to them that devise iniquity and work evil upon their beds. When the morning is light, they practice it because it is in the power of their hand. And they covet fields and take them by violence and houses and take them away. So they oppress a man in his house, even a man in his heritage. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, against this family do I devise an evil, from which ye shall not remove your necks, 
Neither shall ye go haughtily, for this time is evil. The Lord called a time at this point in the history of Israel an evil time. People would do the things that Micah described. Now in chapter 3, he speaks very severely and very extensively about the sins of the crooked leaders and the false prophets. Notice in chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, he says, And I said, <clears throat> Here I pray you, O heads of Jacob, and ye princes of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know judgment, who hate the good and love the evil, who pluck off their skin from off them and their flesh from off their bones, who also eat the flesh of my people and flay their skin from off them, and they break their bones and chop them in pieces as for the pot and as flesh within the children. These people had become so evil, so depraved, so corrupt, that they were cutting the flesh off and putting them in the pots, as it were, to eat the flesh of the people. In verse 5, he goes on to say, Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets that make my people err, that bite with their teeth and cry, Peace, and he that putteth not into their mouths, they even prepare war against him. Now in verse 11 of chapter 3, the heads thereof judge for reward, and the priests thereof teach for hire, and the prophets thereof divine for money. Yet will they lean upon the Lord and say, Is not the Lord among us? None evil can come upon us. They would do all the evil that they could do, and then they would say, Well, God is with us. He's not going to let anything bad happen to us. How grossly they had deceived themselves in regard to their relationship with God. We're still God's people. God's not going to let any bad thing happen to us. We can be just as wicked as we want to be. The false prophets were immoral and they worshiped the gods. The rulers hated the good and they loved the evil. And the people cried out for mercy, but he says, God's not going to hear your cry. Micah then threatened the people with a failure for there to be any more prophecy from God. Notice in chapter 3, verses 6 and 7. <clears throat> Therefore, night shall be unto you, that ye shall not have a vision. And it shall be dark among you, that ye shall not divine. And the sun shall go down over the prophets, and the day shall be dark over them. Then shall the seers be ashamed, and the diviners confounded. Yea, they shall all cover their lips, for there is no answer from God. He said there's coming a time when God is not going to be answering you. Because you've separated yourself so far from Him by your corruption. The book of Micah answers the question of why would a man become a false prophet? And the answer to that is several fold. Number one, he seeks after personal gain. Number two, he wants to please the people. In Jeremiah chapter 5, verses 30 and 31, Jeremiah spoke of the very same thing. An astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule by their own power. And my people love to have it so. But what will you do in the end? You want to have things your way. You don't want to have them God's way. But guess what? There's going to be an end coming. And you're not going to like what's going to be happening. Not only that, but the false teacher is self-deceived and self-satisfied. I'm content where I am. I'm happy with what I'm doing, with the way I'm living my life, even though I'm not living according to the law that God has given unto His people. In chapter 3 and verse 8, Micah says that sin must be denounced. When he declared that he was preaching by the power of the Holy Spirit, notice specifically what he says in the latter part of that verse. He says that I will declare unto Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. My job, he says, is to tell this nation where it has gone wrong in the sight of God. Brethren, today we need to take that to heart. We need to be preaching the Word of God to try to bring every nation under the sun back to God or to God to begin with. Sin must be denounced. Micah is one of the first prophets to threaten Judah with the destruction of Jerusalem and its temple. Notice what he says in chapter 3 and verse 12. 
Therefore shall Zion for your sake be plowed as a field, and Jerusalem shall become heaps, and the mountain of the house as the high places of the forest. And so he says, the end is coming to Jerusalem. Now in chapters 4 and 5, he discusses comfort and hope for the future. And one thing that we see, if we read very carefully, <clears throat> in the message is that the prophets of God are declaring to his people. They proclaim destruction. They proclaim the sins of the people. And the result of that will be destruction. And in many instances, it's going to involve the idea of being taken away into captivity. But then he also provides for them a way of hope, a way that they can come back to him. It is great that we have an opportunity to come back to God. How awful it would be for there to be no hope at all. We, Brother Johnny, this morning talked about the fact that we all need hope. We need God's grace. We need the idea that when we are in error, we can repent and come back to God if it's genuine repentance. And God was giving this kind of hope unto Israel. <clears throat> he says, the law will go forth from Zion, meaning that the kingdom would be established and the gospel would go forth out of Jerusalem. Notice chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow unto it. And many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For, out of the, for the law shall go forth out of Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among many people, and rebuke strong nations afar off. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Somebody says, I thought somebody else wrote that. Well, he did. The prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah 2, verses 2 through 4. What we have in Micah and in Isaiah are almost word for word the same prophecy of the coming of the kingdom of the Lord. It's a very important message. The punishment, he tells us, is a punishment that will fit the crimes of the people in chapters 4 and 5. In chapter 5 and verse 2, he tells us that the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. What a beautiful picture that paints right here in the middle of this book that the deliverer, the Messiah, will come forth from that little village in Bethlehem. And then he lets us know that if we're going to find any hope, the hope that must be found is found in the Prince of Peace, chapter 4 and verse 3. And then in the future, in the future, there would be a remnant of God's people. As was mentioned earlier in a couple of the earlier lessons as well. There would be a remnant of God's people who would survive. Chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. Notice that he says, And I will make her, excuse me, and the remnant of Jacob, and the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many people as a dew from the Lord, as the showers upon the grass that tarrieth not for man, nor waiteth for the sons of men. And the remnant of Jacob shall be among the Gentiles in the midst of many people as a lion among the beasts of the forest, as a young lion among the flocks of sheep, who, if he go through, both treadeth down and teareth in pieces, and none can deliver. So in chapters 4 and 5, we have those major points. And then in chapters 6 and 7, we find that he speaks of the way of salvation and he presents this as a type of court scene. He asks the question, what has the Lord done? The idea is for the nation of God's people to have gone so far away from the Lord, what is it that God has done that is so bad, so evil to you, that you would treat him in the way that you have treated him 
by going in these depraved ways through idolatry, through immorality, the rejection of His divine will. In chapter 6, verses 3 through 5, notice what it said. O my people, what have I done unto thee? And wherein have I wearied thee? Testify against me. For I brought thee up out of the land of Egypt and redeemed thee out of the house of thy servants. Of servants. And I sent before thee Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O my people, remember now what Balak the king of Moab consulted, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered them from the Acacia Grove and the Gilgal, that ye may know the righteousness of the Lord. He's asking important questions to make them stop and think, what has God done so evilly to you that you would turn your back on Him? And then there are questions that come back in this form in verses 6 and 7. Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before Him with burnt offerings and calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? What is it that God wants? Does He want all of the livestock I've got? Does He want my children? What does God want of me anyway? Well, God gives His answer in the very next verse. Three simply stated requirements. Notice what he says in verse 8. He has shown the old man what is good. And what does the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God? That's what he wants. With all the sacrifices that God required of the law, he said, what I want out of you more than those sacrifices is I want you. I want you to be just I want you to be merciful, and I want you to walk humbly with me. Because you see, their defiance of the will of God, and their carrying out their own will was, in fact, a failure to walk humbly with God. It was the result of their own selfish arrogance and pride. We compare what is said here with what our Lord said in Matthew, or rather Mark, chapter 12, and verse 37. For he said that uh, David called him Lord, and the common people heard him gladly. The common people heard the Lord gladly. In the days of Micah, the, the many of the people were not hearing the Lord gladly at all. In James chapter uh, 1 and verse 27, James talks about pure religion. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Micah also laments the disappearance of righteous people in that time. Chapter 7 and verse 2. The good man is perished out of the earth, and there is none upright among men. They all lie in wait for blood. They hunt every man his brother with a net. Sounds pretty bad. And it was extremely bad during that time. There will, however, Micah says, be mercy after judgment. There will be an opportunity for all the people to come back and to be the people that God wants them to be. We see that in chapter 7, beginning in verse 18. And I find this to be a most beautiful and very comforting passage of Scripture. In Micah 7, beginning at verse 18, Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever, because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities, and thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Thou wilt perform the truth to Jacob and the mercy to Abraham, which thou hast sworn unto our fathers from the days of old. What comfort! What compassion is being offered by God for the people if they will simply repent and come back to Him. And we learn from that that our God is a merciful God. He is a gracious God. And I was thinking during uh, 
the, uh, the lesson that Brother Andrew was teaching a few minutes ago about how that God's grace was manifested many, many times in the Old Testament, not only among His people, the Jews, but among the Gentiles as well. Great lessons on the grace of God for people of both Jew and Gentile in the Old Testament as well as the New. But let's take a look at some important lessons that might come from this wonderful little book. Let's talk about the problem of authority, for example. The question of authority is basic to the book of Micah. Rulers, prophets, priests, and the people did not have respect for God and His Word that they should have had. Idolatry threatened to replace the concept and worship of the one true God. Raven images and idols were in abundance throughout the land, and people had no regard for the God of heaven who had led them out of the land of Egypt. Both Israel and Judah had departed from God, and both of them were in really deep trouble. <coughs> Micah sought to bring to God's people the acknowledgement of their own sins and back to respect the authority of God. That's what it was really all about. They didn't respect the authority of God. God's true authority is contrasted with the false authority of idols and prophets that cause the people to err, cause them to sin. In chapter 6 and verse 16, For the statutes of Omri are kept, all the works of Ahab's house are done, and you walk in their counsels, that I may make you a desolation, and your inhabitants a hissing. Therefore you shall bear the reproach of my people. Somebody says, well, who is Omri? Well, Omri was the father of King Ahab. He was a king, and uh, he was one of the most wicked, if not the wickedest king of all, among the people of God. He brought in all the idol worship, among others. He brought in gross things that were done by the people of Israel. And so Micah is saying that the people, even generations later, are still keeping the statutes, the laws of King Omri, and have fallen in the way of Ahab, and they're continuing to sin generation after generation. You have refused to respect the God of heaven. The lack of respect, friends, for the authority of the Bible in our time, in the 21st century, is extremely alarming. Many years ago, when I was a boy, uh, people, many of them, didn't respect the Word of God, but we had a lot who did in our nation who respected the Bible as God's Word, even though they didn't always follow it. If you would walk up to people back in the 1940s and 50s and say, you know, the Bible says thus and so, you might actually get them to stop and spend some time studying the Bible. Today, if you say, you know, the Bible says thus and so, they say, what's that? Another, another book of fairy tales? A book of myths? We don't want to hear what the Bible says. We don't care what the Bible says. You folks are out of touch. You're out of tune. Y'all need to get back and learn something new, something modern. Well, for God's Word to be authoritative, it must be inspired. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto every good work. Man does not learn the deep things of God by his own power of observation. But the Bible tells us the Holy Spirit searched the mind of God and revealed God's mind unto man. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9. As a matter of fact, the very words need to express the divine <laughs> ideas and precepts of God were chosen by the Holy Spirit from the vocabularies of the inspired writers. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning at verse 9, here's the way the Apostle Paul stated it. But as it is written, I have not seen or ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man save the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the
the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual words. Words are vehicles of, idea, of ideas. And the Spirit of God gave the very words to the inspired writers, and they wrote them down, and they have become God's holy and divine word. The ultimate aim of inspiration was to produce an inspired book. 